Our scripture today comes from John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garment and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. The word of the Lord. Well, several years ago, a famous composer by the name of Leonard Bernstein was asked a really important question by our journalist reporter. And the question was, what instrument is the hardest instrument to play out of all of the instruments? To which Bernstein replied, the second fiddle. He said, I can get plenty of first violinists, but to find someone who can play the second fiddle with enthusiasm, that's a problem. And if we have no second fiddle, we have no harmony. There's an old rhyme that echoes Bernstein's sentiments. It goes like this. It needs more skill than I can tell to play the second fiddle and play it well. We live in a culture that encourages us to fight for the first chair. We live in a culture that tells us that we should chase acclaim and praise and glory and position and status and power above really just about anything else. We live in a culture that is desperate for recognition. I don't know about you, um, I I watched Hamilton over COVID because they put it on Disney Plus and it's amazing and I've never seen it before and maybe you've seen it and you know it as well, but there's this, um, there's this song that uh, I can't even remember the guy's name now because I didn't pay that close attention to it, uh, where the guy's like longing to be in the room where it happens. You know what I'm talking about? I just want to be in the room where it happens. I want to be in the room where all of the decisions are made. But more than that, I want to be the one making the decisions. I want to be the one in the seat of power, the seat of, seat of status and authority. We all have this desire to be first violinists, even if we're not musicians. And as a result, it's really hard to find people who will serve out of the limelight and in the shadows. I love how one poet put it. She described her own struggle with this. She said, you know, Lord, how I serve you with great emotional fervor in the limelight. You know how eagerly I speak for you at a woman's club. You know how I effervesce when I promote a fellowship group. You know my genuine enthusiasm at a Bible study. But how would I react, I wonder, if you pointed me to a basin of water and asked me to wash the calloused feet of a bent and wrinkled old woman day after day, month after month, in a room where nobody saw and nobody knew? I think most of us would have a really hard time with that. For being honest, I mean, you can be honest. We'd, we'd have a hard time with that. Humility and selflessness 
are not natural qualities. We are not born with them. And if we're really being honest, I think the reason we have, we have a hard time imagining ourselves picking up a basin and towel and serving in the shadows is because most of us are really only interested on, in, in sitting on little thrones and building our own little kingdoms. I can say that with pretty good confidence and assurance because I know that the disciples were like that. In fact, the story that Brittany just read for us, the context of that story is actually in Luke. Luke, the, the gospel writer in chapter 22, verse 24, tells us what the context of it is. That the fact that Christ's incredible humility was actually to correct or rebuke the disciples' insatiable longing for power. Look at it with me. When they had gathered together in the upper room, a dispute arose among them as to which of them should be regarded as the greatest. Now, I want you to just try to imagine what's going on in this scene right now. The disciples have just seen Jesus raise a dead man back to life, Lazarus. Then they witnessed him get up on a donkey and ride into the city of Jerusalem where tens of thousands of people are worshiping him as king. They are more sure now than ever before that something's about to happen, that Jesus is about to take power, the kingdom's going to be established, and they're going to be ruling and reigning with him. They're, they're confident of that at this point. And so in the midst of this, now they're arguing over power and position because Jesus is about to take over, so which one is going to be ruling on his right and on his left when this takeover happens? Now, in Jewish culture, uh, foot washing was a unique job. It was, it was reserved for the lowest of the low. It was such a, uh, a uniquely low and humble job that uh, Jewish slaves weren't even allowed to do it. Uh, the Midrash actually commanded that Jewish slaves weren't allowed to do it. So it, if you were a Jew and you were a slave, you were still exempt from washing people's feet. It was that dirty. It was that low. Only the unclean Gentile slaves could carry out this task. And so those slaves who actually carried out this job had a nickname. You know what their nickname was? People of the towel. People of the towel. Those are the people who wash other people's feet. Those dirty, stinky, smelly, first century feet. Now evidently, since Jesus and his disciples are in hiding, there weren't any people of the towel there. No one knew where they were. And so every house had a giant jar of water at the entrance. And whenever you'd go into a house, there would be a person of the towel next to the jar and they would wash your feet, and you would enter the house with clean feet, and you would recline, and you would eat your meal. So the disciples get there, and Jesus gets there, and there's the jar, and, and the water's in the jar, but there is no Gentile slave there to take care of them. And so immediately, they start arguing about who is the greatest among them. And again, I just want you to try to put yourself in their shoes, because I, I think, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I think the reason that they were arguing was because um, it wasn't just that they wanted to show who was the greatest. They actually wanted to not be the lowest. They didn't want to have to be the one that washed everyone else's feet. In, in the rabbinic culture, the disciples were responsible for serving their master. Now, we don't have this now, but, but Jesus was a rabbi, and they were his disciples. And so in that culture, it was their job to make sure their master had his needs met, that he was comfortable, that he was clean. And so if you showed up to a dinner and there was no person of the towel, it wasn't the master's job to make sure that their feet got washed. It was their job to make sure his feet got washed. But again, they think he's about to take over the Roman Empire. And so I think in their minds, they thought, whoever washes his feet is not going to be at the right or the left when the kingdom is established. Whoever washes his feet now is going to get overlooked. And they, their argument over who was the greatest was really a matter of not wanting to be the lowest. I can just see how they were having this conversation. I'll bet you they looked at Peter and said, Peter, you do it. And Peter has to defend himself. He's like, no way. I'm the one that walked on the water. I'm not the lowest. Maybe they looked at John. John, you do it. 
And he's like, heck no, I'm, I'm the disciple that Jesus loves. That's like his favorite nickname for himself. Well, James, what about you? No, not me. I'm, I'm in the inner three. I'm in the inner circle. That's definitely not my job. Judas, you do it then. And you're just like, no, I, I, I take care of the money. I'm the treasurer of this band. Like, I, I'm not the lowest of And they're arguing now, back and forth. Not just about who's the greatest, but who's not the lowest. You see that? Lauren uh, Sani, who's the president of the Navigators, was once asked by a businessman, how, how can you know when you start to have a servant's attitude? Have you ever asked that? How do you know when you have arrived at a place of humility? <laughs> because like the moment you think you're humble, then you're not humble anymore. How do you know when you've arrived at humility? How do you know when you have a servant's attitude? To which Lauren replied, by how you act when you're treated like a servant. That's how you know. Nobody wants to be treated like a servant. Especially 12 men who think they're about to take over Rome and rule alongside a Messiah. But guys, we all struggle with this, every single one of us. We're all just like them. We all want to fight for a throne, but not for a towel. But it's in the midst of this fight that the king above all other kings and the God above all other gods rises from the table and becomes a man of the towel. You can imagine a hush swept over the room. Shock, awe, embarrassment. Why, why didn't I get the towel first? What is he doing? Peter says, how dare you? You can't wash my feet. No way, I'll wash yours. The one who's actually the greatest among them becomes the lowest. The one who is worthy of the throne gives it up. The master becomes the slave and serves his disciples. And guys, what we have to see is that this is what he's been trying to show them his entire ministry. If you've been with us for the last few months in the Gospel of John, you know that the way up is down. This is the paradox of the good life. This is the paradox of Zoe. The way to power is through service. The way to glory is through suffering. The way to greatness is through humility. The way to happiness is through sacrifice. He's been teaching this for three and a half years. He's been modeling this for three and a half years. But guys, they still haven't gotten it. It's too counterintuitive. It's too countercultural. It cuts against everything they think they know about the world. And honestly, guys, they won't even get it till after the resurrection. But this is what Jesus wants them to get. And so on the eve of his execution, he shows them one more time. This is what it really means to live. This is what true greatness looks like. What I really want us to focus on today is the fact that Jesus wants us to follow his example. When you look at a story like this, we could spend so much time in the act itself, but I really want us to focus on the end of the act, when Jesus says, do you understand what I've just done? I want to get to the significance. I want to get to the meaning behind it. I want you to become people of the towel. That's what this is all about. Look at verse 12, and we'll go to verse 17 to see his words again. When he washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you get it? Finally, now, after three and a half years, do you understand this? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, happy are you, blessed are you, if you do them. Now, if you were paying attention, in, in those verses, Jesus says three times what he expects of his disciples. You ought to wash one, one another's feet. You should do this thing that I've done for you. 
Blessed are you if you do these things. It's almost as if he's just tired of being the teacher and everyone being like, wow, Jesus, that was a great lesson. That was so good. Well, I took like 10 pages of notes on that one. Or like they heard this parable of the good Samaritan, like, wow, that, never saw that coming. Samaritans can be good. It's like he's sick of them saying great sermon. And, and now he's just like, the point is this. I want you to actually do this stuff. And you're still not getting it. You're still arguing about who's the greatest. You're still fighting over not serving. Please get this. If I'm doing it and I'm your master, you've got to follow on my footsteps. See, it's so easy to look at Jesus. It's so easy to marvel at his humility. And honestly, we should. We should marvel at his sacrifice. We should marvel at his selflessness. It should blow us away, his selflessness. And at the same time, it's easy to marvel at those things and miss the fact that he expects us to do something about it. It's easy to listen to the things he says. It's easy to learn the things he says. It's easy to memorize the things that he says and never put them into practice. The disciples were kings of this. They had not been changed. They still weren't living like him. They hadn't become what he wanted them to become yet. And so Jesus says three times, start doing it. Start doing it. Start doing it. This doesn't feel good. I know this doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good for me. The reason it doesn't feel good is because we're just like them. We're good listeners. You guys are great listeners. You were so fun to preach for. You guys take notes. You, I think you're smiling under your mask sometimes. You just chuckled. So kind of you. We're great listeners. We're not very good obeyers. We're not very good doers. I want to stop here for a minute because you and I need to hear this today. See, I think there's a mentality here. I know there's a mentality here in the West that acts as if any kind of call to obey or any kind of command to do is like some legalistic, anti-gospel, anti-grace, anti-Jesus demand. Have you ever felt that? Any call to purity, any call to service, any call to be in the world but not of the world. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. that's not the gospel. The gospel doesn't make demands. We're so passionate about our personal autonomy that even the word command rubs us the wrong way. Like, it's offensive that we would be commanded to do anything. That's offensive to us here in, in the great United States of America. The thought that Jesus would require or demand or expect anything of us is repulsive. Have you ever thought about this? We have so many pastors, so many shepherds telling us that Jesus exists to grant us the desires of our own hearts. So how could, how could he ever expect us to give up our desires if he exists to give us our desires? Have you ever thought that? Why would he expect me to follow him to the cross when he knows that what I want more than anything is comfort. I mean, not my Jesus. My Jesus just wants my happiness. You ever said that? I have. My Jesus would never tell me to give up my power. My Jesus would never tell me to lay down my rights. My Jesus would never tell me to sacrifice my desires because my Jesus exists for me. And yet Jesus says the complete opposite in verse 17. If you want to be happy, if you want to be blessed, you can't just know these things. You must start doing them. Don't just listen to my words. Follow my example. Now, guys, this is incredibly difficult. If, if we're actually going to obey this, which that would be the goal of this today, to not leave and say, I feel really great after that sermon. The goal of this today is for us to leave as people of the towel. So if we're going to do that, it's going to be incredibly hard and incredibly difficult. Humility, selflessness, sacrifice are just as counterintuitive and 
countercultural today as they were 2,000 years ago, right? So, how are we supposed to do this? How are we, 21st century Americans, supposed to lay down our rights? How are we supposed to set aside our privileges? How are we supposed to give up our desires so that we actually follow in Jesus' footsteps and become people of the towel, the lowest of the low? That's the big question, and that's really the question that I want to answer today because for me, I need, I need the how and I need the why if I'm going to be able to do the what, and I know you're the same exact way. Jesus gives us two answers in this text. I think John shows us in this story two things that Christ possessed that enabled him to become a man of the towel, two things that I would say empowered his humility, and, and these are two things that if, if we would take a hold of today, will enable us to follow in his footsteps, no matter how difficult it might be. And these are the, the two things I want to give you today. That's it. Just two. Not three. Just two. Are you ready? The first thing that Christ had, that Christ possessed, that enabled his humility was his love. His humility was enabled by what he loved. Look back at verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. John is setting up this incredible act of service, act of humility, and he's doing it by showing us What's going on in the heart of Jesus? What it is that not only enables what he's about to do, but causes him to do what, what he's about to do. And he doesn't just want us to see the act. He wants us to see what compelled the act. And so the first thing he, he shows us is his heart was full of love. He didn't mind giving up his rights. He didn't mind giving up his honor, his position, taking the role of a Gentile slave because he loved his disciples. Having loved them, he loved them to the very end. To the very end is a phrase that literally means to completion, to the end of the goal that he had for them. So even though they hadn't grasped all of his lessons or put his teachings into practice, even though they were still fighting for power and using him as a means to their own ends, which don't get it twisted, that's exactly what they were doing. Even though he knew every single one of them would abandon him, betray and deny him in a matter of hours, he loved them to completion. He loved them to perfection, to the very end. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty, you might become rich. That's the completion. That's the end goal. That you might become rich. Now, when I say rich, I'm not talking about like, you know, Kanye West rich. I'm talking about rich in Christ. Spiritually, you are totally impoverished spiritually. He became totally impoverished took on all of your sins so that you could become perfect. That's the end goal of his love. So everything that he did from Bethlehem to Calvary through the tomb and then back again to glory, he did it all because he loved you and wanted to accomplish something in you. That's what enabled him to serve his disciples. I think the big question that we need to ask here is what would it look like for us to love others like Christ loves us, to the very end. Meaning, we don't give up on people halfway through. We don't stop loving and caring for people and praying for people, even when they do everything they can to make our lives miserable. We love them to the end, until the goal is accomplished. What would that look like? How would that kind of love manifest itself if we were to serve our family and our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers like that? Paul says it in, in 1 Corinthians 10, 24. He says exactly what it would look like. That we wouldn't seek our own good, but that we would seek the good of our neighbor. 
Watchman Nee is a, a Chinese leader. He's an author of The Last Generation. He told the story of a Chinese Christian rice farmer. He owned a rice paddy next to uh, an atheist, communist rice farmer. And the atheist hated this Christian farmer and wanted nothing to do with Christ and did everything he could to make the Christian's life miserable. Uh, the, the Christian farmer irrigated his land, which you, know, you just have to dump tons of water on a rice paddy to, to get rice to grow. And he, he would irrigate his land by pumping water out of a canal next to his field. And he would do that by riding one of those like, stationary bikes. And he would pound that bike, like Bobby, <laughs> on his little stationary bike. He would pound that bike for hours every single day. And after all of that hard work, finally, he would have enough water in his paddy to be good to go. Every single day, after several hours of pumping, his rice paddy would be covered with water, but when he left, his neighbor would remove two blocks of wood that separated his field from his neighbor's field. He would remove these two blocks of wood, and all of the water that this Christian had just pumped into his yard would flow down into the atheist's yard so that he wouldn't have to work for his water. This happened over and over again, day after day. And as you can imagine, I mean, the, the Christian farmer was getting incredibly irritated, frustrated. He was struggling with anger and resentment. Finally, in desperation, he prayed, Lord, if this keeps going, I'm going to lose all my rice. I might even lose my field. I have a family to care for. This isn't right. This isn't fair. It isn't just. What should I do? What would you do in that situation? Just think about it. What would you do in that situation? In answer to his prayer, the Lord impressed upon his heart a challenge to apply the truth of John 13 and follow the example of Christ. To lay down his rights to fairness and justice and serve his neighbor. So what happened? The next morning, the farmer got up earlier than usual in the pre-dawn hours of darkness. He removed all the boards from his field that separated his paddy from his neighbor's paddy, and he started to pump water into the field of his neighbor. Then he replaced the boards and pumped water into his own rice field. In a few weeks, both fields of rice were thriving, and the communist atheist came to faith in Jesus Christ. That testimony is unnatural, it's counterintuitive, it's countercultural. We don't know anything of that in our culture, right? Have you ever seen anything like that before? can't be dismissed. It's too loving to be ignored. And this is the point. Jesus loved his disciples to the very end. He wasn't focused on who they were then and there. He was focused on what he was going to transform them into. He didn't see their abandonment. He didn't see their denial. He saw the faithfulness and the boldness that he was going to put in them. In other words, he didn't see their pride. He didn't see their selfishness. He saw all of these incredible fruits that he was going to produce in them. And so he loved them, never gave up on them until that fruit was produced. He's always looking into the future, always seeing what could be, what they could become. His love wasn't conditional, it wasn't transient, it was committed, it was trustworthy. And the guys, I want to stop here because every single one of you have people in your life who are really difficult. Neighbors, family members, co-workers, people who are doing everything they possibly can to make your life miserable. Everything in you is tempted to give up on them, right? I mean, everything... And our culture says you have the right to give up on them. 
to stand up for yourself, to pursue justice and fairness, to leave him in your dust or whatever. But that's not what Christ did for us. His love for us was stronger than our hatred for him. And so the only way we can be like him, guys, is to see his love, to marvel at his love, to be so consumed by his love that it actually causes us to love other people in the same way. Love enables humility. It's what makes it possible. Second, his humility was enabled by what he knew. Verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. So you can see these two statements. These are the, the enabling factors that are leading up to him rising from supper and becoming a person of the towel, loving them to the end and knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. It wasn't just what he loved that enabled his humility, guys. It was what he knew about the future. It's what he knew about the sovereignty of his father. He knew that the father had given all things into his hands and that he was going back to God. In other words, he knew that there was nothing more than a short period of time in between that moment and the moment of his ascension when he would be at the right hand of God and he would be worshipped as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, when everything would be placed under his feet and everyone and everything in heaven and on earth would be worshipping him. He's, he's just a short period of time from that. He knows that the Father has given him that. And people often say that it was in spite of that knowledge that he got on his knees, picked up a towel, and washed his disciples' feet. But John says it's not in spite of that knowledge. It's because of that knowledge. That knowledge is what enabled him to do that. You see, it was the fact that he knew that God had already placed eternal glory in his hands that enabled him to set his glory aside. It's the fact that God had already placed justice in his hands that enabled him to wash the feet of his enemy and betrayer. Have you ever asked how in the world could he wash Judas's feet? Why would, why would he let Judas go and betray him? Because he knew that God had already given him justice. It was the fact that God had already given him a crown, that God had already established his throne that enabled him to give up his comfort and pick up a towel. Here's the point I really want you to see. Since he had already received everything from his father, he didn't need anything else from his disciples. We've got to get this. That's what freed him to love and serve. As long as we need things from each other, as long as we need things from other people, we'll never actually be free to love and serve them. We won't be able to lay down our rights. We won't be able to lay down our wishes. We'll always feel like we have to fight for other people to meet those things for us. You see, the reason we serve so well in the limelight and not in the shadows is because we still need honor and praise from people. But if we could get the fact that in Christ, the God of the universe has already showered us with honor and approval and praise, it wouldn't matter. The reason we get upset when we're overlooked, the reason that we get offended when we're asked to do a job that we think is beneath us is because we still need our peers to tell us that we matter, that we're significant. But if we could get the fact that God thinks we matter so much that he sent his one and only son into the world to become one of us, to save us, that he has already pre prepared a place for us in his presence and he cannot wait to spend eternity in fellowship with us, then we wouldn't need other people to tell us that we matter because we would know we do matter. 
the disciples walked into that room needing to prove their worth. Not just to Jesus, not just to each other, but to themselves. I'm valuable. I matter. And the reason they had to prove that is because they hadn't had Christ. They hadn't believed that Christ had already done that for them. Jesus didn't walk into that room needing to prove anything, guys. Jesus was totally secure. He didn't need to prove anything to anyone. He didn't need to prove anything to himself. Guys, this is what true freedom is. We're, we're, we love freedom. We don't know what freedom is in America. This is true freedom. Galatians 5.1 says, For freedom, Christ has set you free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. So what's freedom? For freedom, Christ, what is that freedom? Verse 13 tells us, you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. That's what freedom is. We have been set free so now we actually have the ability to love our neighbors and serve our neighbors. We do not need anything from them anymore. We can give up everything for them. See, once we get the fact that in Christ, God has already placed everything in our hands. Ephesians 1 tells us this. In Christ, God has already placed everything into our hands. Identity. Justice, redemption, love, meaning, pleasure, status, and even glory, they are all ours in Christ right now and forevermore. If we get that, we won't have to prove our worth anymore. If we get that, we won't have to fight for our rights anymore. We can actually turn the other cheek. When someone demands that we give them a shirt, we give them our jacket too. When someone says, walk one mile with me, we say, let me give you two miles. Because we don't need anything from him anymore. We don't have to strive for our own glory. We can lay it all down. And in humility and selflessness, we can serve. Some of you have been wronged. Some of you are in the process of being wronged. And you have a correct and right longing for justice. God has already given it to you. You don't have to seek it. Some of you are being overlooked at work right now. Some of you are dealing with all kinds of political drama in your job and you're doing a great job but people are stabbing you in the back and you're offended and you're upset and everything in you wants to fight against that person to prove your value. You don't have to do it anymore. Your value has already been placed in your hands in Christ. What would it look like for us to believe that? Christ's humility was enabled by what he knew. I want to close today with uh, a picture of the dirtiest man alive. Literally, that is the dirtiest man alive. His name is Amu Haji, and he has gone 60 years without bathing, which is a world record, by the way. 60 years without bathing. An article in the Middle East Monitor reported this, and I quote, The man eats dead animals, and his most prized possession is his pipe, which is three inches in diameter, in which he smokes animal dung. Amu lives, yeah, just let that, that's, let that sink in. I know you want to gasp. Amu lives in a stone shack built for him by his neighbors. He rests in a hole in a ground resembling a grave. And this news agency noted that when he feels cold, he wears a helmet and lights up several cigarettes at a time. That's the dirtiest man alive. If you're having a hard time fathoming what it might look like for you 
to become a person of the towel. That's a really hard thought to, to grasp. I want you to remember that compared to Christ's glory and compared to his perfection, every single one of us look just like a moo. Every single one of us. Covered in filth. Unapproachable because, because of the stench of our own sin. If, if people knew it was in your heart, if people knew it was in your mind, as, as Caleb prayed during confession, everyone would run for the hills. We, 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 we wear, wear really pretty masks. I mean, we know how to hide the evil that's in us really, really well. But if we're being honest, if, if, there was a, if, my, if my thoughts and all of my motives and all of my longings and all of my sin that only I think I know about was projected onto that screen, I know that every single one of you would bolt out of this place like that. It's true of every single one of us, guys. And when, when that, when, when this is placed next to the perfection of Christ, you know, you know who every single one of us are? That man. This doesn't mean that we're not valuable. This doesn't mean that we're not image bearers of Christ. It just means that we are stained by our own sin. If you're having a hard time thinking about loving the unlovely, remember that Christ loved you when you looked like that. And even though every single person in the entire world would flee from you, and justly so, Christ ran towards you. He stood up, went to that pot of water, grabbed the towel, dipped it in the basin. He stooped at your sin-covered feet, and he washed you for the first time. He made you clean. There was nothing that you did to earn that, to deserve that. But he loved you, and he loved you to the end. If we're going to follow in his footsteps, we've got to be consumed by that love. It's got to consume our minds and our thoughts. It's got to consume our hearts. Then and only then will it flow out of us, and will we be able to love like he loved. Let it blow you away. May it enable us to follow in his footsteps so that we can trade our thrones for the towel, become people just like him for his glory. Would you stand as we pray?